Welcome to the Man Other Prize podcast. Thanks for joining me for another week. My guest this week, our case study is Moeed. Welcome. How are you today, sir? So thank you so much for having me. I am blessed. I am, you know, counting my blessings every day and I'm doing spectacular. Thank you for asking. That's good to hear. Fantastic. So let's get started. I start every episode the same way. I am an expert in really just one thing, and that is being myself. These conversations are opportunities for men to hear men being vulnerable, opening up, talking about their experiences. And I hope hearing these episodes, it will allow you to feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable enough to talk to somebody, anybody about what you're feeling. That's really the point of this. And if this leads to you feeling comfortable enough to talk about what's going on in your life, please find someone who you're comfortable speaking with, a friend, a family member, a mentor, someone who's trained for this, a psychologist, a psychotherapist, anyone, please make sure you find someone. It is important as men that we recognize that our feelings are valid and that we need to express them and not to hold them in. That's what gets us into trouble. So find someone to talk to, and I hope this leads you in the right direction. So take a moment and recognize that your emotions are valid and they're valid to be expressed. So with that said, Moeed, are you ready to begin? I'm, I, I was born ready. Let's do this. All right. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> so the listeners have already heard a biography about you, but I'm going to ask you if I could, if you had to give me a 10 second quick biography about you. I never met you, but I needed to understand you in about 10 seconds. Could you tell me something right now? Dynamic, unconventional, um, exist uh, unshamedly with my purpose. And above all, I'm here to make sure that I live a holistic life that's gonna benefit me and the people around me without regrets. I like that. Well done. That's good. Sounds like you said that before. <laughs> Sounds excellent. No, 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 not exactly. To be, to be fair, there was about half of it because those are the principles I live by, but they were just vocalized that way in the moment. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So the way I do this podcast is I came up with a mantra using the letters in the word prize, P-R-I-Z-E. -I, I take each letter except the middle one, and each of these letters represent a characteristic, as something that I feel when defined, when discussed, make a good man. And that's what this is. And when we're done, the I, the letter in the middle, is the culmination of everything we spike, we talk about. So we're going to go through each letter. I'll throw some questions at you. And hopefully, we'll get an understanding about you. So that's sure. where we're going to begin. The first letter in the word prize is P, and the word is purpose. Definition of purpose is reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. So, sir, what is your purpose? I think the biggest purpose that I have is, first of all, as a Muslim is a Muslim, I'm with God's name, I begin. I would say that it's to serve him. At the end of the day, I believe that there is an everlasting life for me personally. And with that being said, that gives me a sense of purpose in determining what my purpose is on this earth. And I believe that every person, whether they're a religious person or not, you look at even all the prophets, they, they were individuals who had um, a multitude of different tasks that they did, but they were centered around one thing. And that was having whatever they were doing, whether that was um, you know, being a carpenter at the time or whatever it is, but that was in relation to serving mankind. So the ultimate purpose that I have as a human being is not what I do for my living, but it's does my living help me do what I need to to serve my purpose as a man on this earth? So that when I leave here, I've left the seeds that have been sown by every single person to say, you know what? He made a difference when it counted, you know? So that purpose is ultimately starting with the self, moving then to your family, moving to your community, and then the people around you, and living a life of self-regulation, self-accountability first, bringing the change that you need in life, starting with yourself. 
and then being able to hold people accountable from a place of other accountability thereafter. Excellent, excellent. So obviously your religion, you mentioned, this ability to be accountable, yes. was this something that you immediately were comfortable with or is this something that grew in you as you grew up with time, with experience? How did you become such an accountable person? I would say it was more ingrained within me uh, since a young age. Because within the Eastern culture, you need to understand that it's much like the Chinese culture. And you could probably you know, empathize and understand as a, as a man of, of, of Black uh, African-American background that when you come from societies where opportunities are not rife, it goes to the individual who comes from you know, family referrals and this and that. Mind you, both my parents were uh, they came from affluential families in the terms of business, but my father was a medical doctor. The reason he left Pakistan, my birth country, when I was about three and a half, was because that did not serve his purpose as a father, as a parent, to provide a good means and a life that we could look upon with dignification. Okay, So when we moved, I realized that accountability is in everything you do. Accountability starts off when you get up in your day and you have to get to school on time. That's accountability. Accountability is knowing that you're going to school to study, not to make friends because friends come and go. Understanding that, you know, that there's no saving grace. There's no, um, you know, backlog. And of course, we'll get into what the implications of that is as well. But that accountability was always put up front as a firstborn more so that, look, you're seeing accountability for younger brother. And now when we move to South Africa, you have another younger brother. Your father's working day in, day out. You see a man struggle. You see a mother who puts everything on the plate from scratch. That's accountability for you. Sit by from the top bottom. So you follow that accountability from there. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. One thing that is really apparent here is accountability doesn't seem to be ingrained in us. It seems like it's a trait that we have to learn, that we have to find, that we have to perfect. While it seems with you, it's ingrained. It's just how you were brought up. It was based on the fact of, of the, your, your family. It has to do with, okay, what is the level of the struggle of the household that you have? I know of a lot of women, for example, David Goggins is an excellent case study for uh, the working middle class or lower poorer class in America that everybody can relate to. It's got nothing to do with which country you're in. Even the Chinese here that I live here next to, there are some of them come from very well being families, but again, discipline is there to, to do that. The reason being why that is, is because there's no room for complacency. As soon as you give a, a child um, an exit route and say, oh, if this doesn't work out, there's this, or you got daddy's money or mommy's money, then, then, then things go that way. And when you were parachute folding, you didn't get a first toy. You didn't have that childhood that came from um, having things, it came from earning things. There's, there's, a, there's a negative disposition to that as well. But right now let's concentrate on the positives and then you can guide the conversation towards looking at that from a holistic perspective. Excellent. I appreciate that. Excellent. Okay, so we've got your purpose done. The next letter in the word prize, the letter is R, the word is resilience. And yes. that is defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. If you can think of, consider any situation, any time in your life that you had to endure that showed the kind of resilience that you have, or maybe you didn't know you had. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, no, so I'll give you the key case study for that in my life, because there's one moment, and I discussed this with my mentor. So what it is, is that when I was in Cape Town, I, my father put me in martial arts. He put me in um, Sado Juko Karate, which is an offshoot of Kyokushin Karate. And that is what GSP and a lot of people use because that's actually a full contact version of Karate that's not very commonly known. Um, and so it was a local community dojo where they emphasized three things, which was um, self-discipline, again. Um, uh, then it was, okay, how do you act towards your parents? 
and then it reinforced how do you act towards your community, those three things. Now, what happened was that I came late because I didn't understand the instructions by the front desk attendant. And she said, you know, you should come at X time. My father took me at that time and that is when the grading was ending. I didn't get my belt that day after years worth of training and there was discipline training where you would do knuckle push-ups, okay, on carpet. It was not easy peasy stuff. Back in those days, it wasn't about easy. It wasn't about giving people belts away. And so a half a year passed, I had all the guys in my group get on, move on to almost getting a yellow, well, close to yellow belt now, moving on to getting a yellow belt. And I didn't get it. And one day I kept on training, kept on training, kept on training. And the sensei came up to me on a weekday, okay, not on grading day, in almost six months later, but on a weekday. And he said, Mohi, do you want a grade today? And I seized that opportunity. And what I learned that day was that you can earn your privilege. Even if something is your right and you've been let down out of it, now that I look back in this moment, compared to where I am now and what I'm going through, you can earn that privilege back. Okay, anything that's lost for you, you can earn back. But you need to have the discipline and the grit to say, why am I doing this? What's my purpose behind it? What is, what is the true dedication behind it? And when I went to Port Elizabeth, which was on the other side, on the East Coast of uh, South Africa, I went to an all boys Christian school where I was one of the slowest um, students who had to work five times as hard because I wasn't a natural ability student. I was very um, observant. I could tell, for example, that different races all pointed fingers at each other, the Taiwanese, the Af uh, African blacks, South African blacks, whites, but they all had the same problems when it came to character. But what I realized was that I could have given up. And I'm here today to tell everybody that you need to do it for yourself as an asthmatic who had asthma in all those days, even doing, uh, you know, getting my, my belts and everything. I still did not let that, um, you know, deter me. And th that has been my mantra for my life, at least that the things are not going to be easy for you. They may be five times as hard, but what's your purpose? Who's going to come save you when they need, when you need it? So that's where resilience comes from because ultimately the, the kid who has all the toys or who has the families, who has the elder brother, they're not going to need that or relies on natural abilities, a top sportsman. What if you don't have any of that? I didn't. A lot of kids, they don't. I didn't have the physique. So you need to have the resilience and have the guts to do it. And I carry that on in terms of public speaking, you know, watching the kid who's a neighbor from me um, have, you know, the ability, he was, a, um, he was a swimmer, he was intelligent, he had all that. And I was like, I just want to beat this guy in public speaking. And that, that was one reason that I would have then taken public speaking in high school. And resilience was, even if I don't come first, even though I had the discipline to study, and my father wanted me to become top and number one based on his medical background and you know coming to South Africa as a doctor. I ultimately don't want to live with regrets. I don't want to save only. That's why the resilience was there. You put your 150% and then if it still doesn't work out, then that's great. Okay. So let me ask you, obviously you, resilience obviously is a big part of your life. Yeah. How, I don't know. Let's say that you could decide whether you could have had maybe the easy life. Maybe you could have just gone through life without any of your challenges. Would you choose to have had an easier road or do you really feel like what you've gone through has really affected you and made you a better man, a better person in general? What do you think? I wouldn't necessarily, and, and that's the thing. I mean, this is a very good question. And the question I need to ask myself and ask every man out there is that, why do you want it easy? Do you want it easy for the sake of easiness or what that easiness will get you? And how can you value what is easy? You never had to bleed for it. Like if my teacher used to say, God bless his soul used to say, and I have not seen him ages, he could be passed away, he could be on, on earth still with us. He used to say that if I gave you a Mercedes, which is often the case here where I live, kids get their Mercedes, they get Lamborghinis because they're, they're coming from rich money families from Hong Kong or wherever, from mainland China. 
is it if I give you a Mercedes um, and you, would you clean it every day? Would you look after it? And he said, but if you had to bleed for that Mercedes, would you then look after it? Because we, you know, we don't, we don't value as human beings something that we didn't work for. I gave you the example of that blue belt. I didn't get it. So I valued it more, right? So I could have, the, the day I had to give it up was the hardest day of my life when I moved to PE because I had a bully who was a, you know, a semi-contact Shodokan champion and he used to use me as his punching bag and my system didn't teach self-defense up to green belt level, which was at least three grades higher. So ultimately I sacrificed that based on principle saying that what's more important, um, you know, my dignity and those things. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself as, as um, Steve Harvey, who you have the same name with, you share his name, Harvey. He says, man, like life's not supposed to be easy because in the, in, the, in the toughness, you realize who you are. It's not about the breaking point. It's about the breakthrough point. We want easy because it's instantly gratification. It makes a justification of why we should feel sloppy for ourselves. I mean, for God's sakes, uh, Please forgive me, and I don't want that forgiveness to anybody who asks for it. But why do you want easy when somebody's struggling five times as hard? For God's sake, get off your butt. What's your excuse for making that? Because when I used to go to Pakistan, and my mother used to take me, dad used to take me from South Africa, I used to think to myself, even living in South Africa, what makes me more deserving than the guy on the street? Same age, those kids, they don't have food. So the reason people are complacent is because they don't have examples of people who are begging on the streets like them with the same age. They're not going to school with people. They're not surrounding themselves with different people who are going through 50 things that they are not. I was lucky I saw those things. So that forced me to say, no, no reason to sit on your butt. And the society here makes you complacent. Every time you give a kid something he wants, every time you surround yourself with people who reaffirmate your um, own shortcomings. That's why it happens. Wow, that's fantastic. You're, <laughs> I'm motivated and I don't know why. <laughs> Just talking to you right now. <laughs> Motivation <laughs> takes you so far. Discipline takes you further. Yes, excellent point, excellent point. We will skip the I for the moment. The next letter in the word prize is, letter is Z, the word is zeal. That is defined as enthusiastic devotion. Yeah. So what are you enthusiastically devoted to? Well, you know, I would say that devotion is not one thing. Okay, devotion means, if they was saying in South Africa at school, whether you did not play sport for even internal league or reserve league, as they would call it, meaning you didn't make it into one of the teams for the cut. And I went to one of the top schools, which is now number one in the country for sport. Okay? And they would say that every kid has three things, trio in juncto in uno, meaning trio means three, in juncto means, to, I believe it's together, somebody can correct me on that, in uno means in one. So means a body, mind, spirit. So the point is that we always tell people that they need to be, because I'm an HR person, this will make it sense that your purpose, your zeal, your devotion in life needs to be centered around one thing. So I'm a, I'm a great case study for that because I wanted to become an engineer because dad was a doctor. He wanted to become an engineer or pilot or whatever the case was. He's intelligent. My grandfather put him to go study medicine. In my case, I wanted to become an engineer. I didn't have the grades. Then I wanted to become um, uh, you know, IT person when that didn't work out. Then I wanted to become an accountant and I got you to Canada. The point is that we put our efforts for so many things and when they don't work out, we need to understand that our zeal for life needs to be in line with what we are capable of. And many people are capable of many things. The problem is we've told ourselves that you need to go find a job and that you need to hit check marks. If you change the focus of and I'll address that question at the end. If you change it to a race, how David Goggins said, he says that life is a race. When you finish one race, you go to the next. And if you see it that way and say that, okay, I want to do podcasting, I want to run my own business, I want to do this, I want to do this. Why is it that, that people like um, 
Damon, I think it's Damon Johnson, who, um, the, you know, the, the Shark Tank guy, African-American guy. Mm-hmm. Why is that that all those people are capable of doing so many things? Because growing up, I was told that you can be dynamic. And that's where my devotion is. I'm not some cookie cutter shaped person that you put in a job and you say four or five years later, you wonder why. And that's why we're having the great um, resignation because people realize they're capable of doing many things. It's because we've been ingrained since our birth to say that our zeal for life is need to be based on um, the way we've been upbringing, the insecurities we've, we've, uh, we've tagged along. And we've never really taken those off, done the work, done a book like No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert E. Glover, which every man should do. Um, and we've not found what the purpose of our, of our living is. We've not done the David Goggins. We've not joined men's groups. We've not sit with other men where we can be vulnerable. I've done those things. So the point is that I realized that growing up dynamism is my zeal and I need to go towards um, within HR, take the set of the way things are done traditionally in my business and change that. Why? Because we've always focused on doing things the way it has been for the sake of it and not changing things so that people have a sense of purpose so that they can pursue their business, they can pursue their dreams. Understanding that everybody is an individual, they may want to public speak, which is one of my other capabilities. I have seven. So when you say zeal, you're, you're not asking what is your zeal for public speaking? You're not asking about, because you, you ask the question, what is that one thing? So you, I think the, the better question is, well, what is your zeal or what, instead of asking what is your zeal, what, what is the purpose? And my purpose is to discover all my purposes or all, all the things I'm good at. And then I'm gonna have a zeal within each of those things. And then it's up to me to prioritize and achieve it. That's excellent. Wow. We underestimate ourselves. That I think is what I kind of get from you is that we we're destined for so much more. And and a lot of times we don't reach for it or we don't see the possibilities. Yeah. How would you, and and as so much based on what you're saying, given the opportunity to tell somebody and let's give, I'll use this. I usually ask this later on, but I feel like it fits now. How would you get a young boy upcoming he's going to be a man how would you how would you describe that to a young man you there's so much you can do don't look for one thing look for many things how would you ingrain that how would you explain that to a young boy growing up you you young boy very simply it it just depends on what age he is okay like i have an e-learning background i've taught kids with autism could you give me one specific example and i'll flesh it out as a case study that people can actually write down and they can follow some steps around what the person needs. Okay, excellent. All right, so there's where we can work around it. That's a question that might be something we go to. Um, the reason I ask that is obviously this whole thing is an attempt to open men up. Very to, simple. Uh, right, it's very it's, simple. Yeah. First of all, what you need to figure out is, um, as a young kid, what is it that you want to achieve? It can be as lofty as you want. So I asked a young man just the other day, I went, I met his brother as part of a social circle that I needed to go out more. That was one of my goals because I've been working three years remotely Monday to Sunday. Mm. Um, So it was, I asked his brother and he said, oh, I don't know what I want to do. Or can I go swim? Is it too late for me to go swim? And the first thing I, I want young people to realize is that you're seeing so much instant gratification, so much success. You're not seeing the, the, the challenges people have to take um, to get there. What you need to figure out is write down on a piece of paper five things that you enjoy, okay? Because if you go to any professional course, they're going to make you do this. Five things you enjoy or five strengths. Now, I want to mention something to somebody that it's okay to be good at something, uh, but it not being your passion. And this is a huge problem that Simon Sinek addresses. Many people don't. So he says that you have your passion. Okay, I want to. I want to do painting. Or I want to do martial arts. Okay, but that's not necessarily translatable. If I have an injury or something happens, can I go pursue my passion that way? No. So the question is that what is it that you want to achieve? So we'll keep it really simple. I'll give you my example. Okay, I'm a young man. I'm in my twenties. I want to achieve something. You put your goal out there, what you want to achieve. You want to put social goals that you want to achieve, okay? So you always put three things. I I spoke about three in Junk to in Uno. 
with three things. And then basically you go interview the people on LinkedIn or you figure out, you create a profile and you go interview those people in those industries that you wanna get into for work. You go to social gatherings, meetups, okay? And you go chat to grownups and people who've been there, they've done that. And then you, they won't mind because people, people are good about talking about their passions, right? They will talk all day. So go to them and then get an idea of what it is from um, doing an example of 35. So I interviewed 35 people in HR to understand what it is that I like and don't like. Okay, and those things change with time. Um, time will make you focus on many different things. Um, but very simply, that's what I would do is I would chat with the people, that's one thing. Then after that, I would go seek the circles where I can get a few things. I would go to a spiritual circle or a group for young men where maybe you have, um, if you're um, you know, in a risk society where you have somebody who came out of drug abuse or something like that, or from a risky neighborhood, and you get them and you do community service that way. Or in my case, if you wanna get into stunt work or something that I'd wanted to think about now, had I, somebody told me, I was like, okay, I'm a martial artist, I'm a young man. And my father's like, I, what are you gonna do with this? Or you're a sports person. Have you thought about how you can translate that to a side gig or coach people? Okay, take whatever talent that you have, if you do have, and maybe convert that to something for you. Okay. So those are some starting points. As far as relationships, it's important to sit with people who have a different view. For example, case study me, go sit with Taiwanese people. Go sit with people that you are scared of sitting with. Go sit with somebody who's got tattoos on their face and is scared that you're gonna judge them and just say, hey man, how's it going? And see how happy that person is. And go sit with these different people, especially people who've gone through more issues. I would not sit with people who are going through the same stuff because they're going to basically reinforce your insecurities. Go around people that have gone through more issues than you and go ask them what they've been through and that will give you clarity on your issues. And then go find those safe people that you can hold you accountable like a peer who has the same objective. And that's only gonna happen once you start sitting in those circles because now you're gonna get, you know, um, you, you uh, you know, uh, the honey hive, you, you're in the right honey hive, so you got access to the right kind of honey that you want. If that makes sense, if I've not been too verbose about it. No, please, I appreciate the verbose. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, what, that's what we want on a podcast, and I appreciate all your words. Um, we'll finish the word prize before we get to the middle. The last letter in prize is E. The word is expectation. That is defined as a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. So when I ask, when I get to this word, what I do is I ask people this, based on what you expect of yourself, what you want to be, what do you expect of yourself based on your experiences, your life, everything that's happened, where do you want to be or where will you be in one year, yeah. in five years, and in 10 years? Okay, nobody knows where they're going to be in five because you could be six feet under. I always say that you live a day. You, one thing I learned in my life was that nothing went according to plan. Okay, and that is what I had a major issue with in North America because I came in here with the expectation that, you know, it was going to be less, it was going to be more civilized. People were going to treat me the way I was in South Africa, but they're just more educated. They're more honest, yada, yada or that they, they have more of a circle of inclusivity and they're, um, they understand this, they're not gonna judge you. It was the exact opposite and worse. Um, and so that's where my expectations started dwindling. You know, and my expectations started dwindling. And then I realized that that's no different from what I'd gone through early on in life. I just let people's expectations of me downgrade my self expectations. So the point that I want to get across to everybody is whether it's in a relationship, stop seeking the approval of other people to, to give you or to set your expectations for you only for you to despise yourself and them for that. Once you do that, you can set a new plan. Okay, you have the power because you have been given life 
and what that purpose is does not have to have a exact clear picture of it because what often we say is i believe that my expectation is i should achieve this okay you need to have goals for what you want and you need to have your purpose which is what you started with and so as long as your purpose changes like i had wanted a picket fence two kids and to finish my accounting degree that went out the window i then wanted to finish my degree and become an hr person and 90% of the time it's caucasian ladies in that profession or people who grow up or there's there's preconceived notions around that okay nobody wants to hire this enigmatic beautiful face sometimes and there was like okay so my expectations are what now for me and that's when i realized that look i learned everything i needed to i'm just sitting here not applying it for me so then what does my game plan look like and that's when you will realize that it's like it's not like one football game i'll end it with this is the football analogy might trigger some people and if it does great if it doesn't that's okay too it's like that or any martial arts tournament when you you're doing the makiwara traditional training or whatever your school or life is training you so that when you go to battle in the fight or in your arena you're you're constantly testing and getting feedback testing and getting feedback what we do is we want instant gratification now and that dwindles our expectations because we've limited our expectations to now when you understand that discipline is the the focus to get to the expectation and if things still don't work out guess what we tweak the game plan like the coach does okay and that's what i teach my kids that look they go like this coach we we didn't score the goal right because the club may have certain directives on um, us being the base club or teaching them so they can get back to parents i'm like end of season i realize that i need to focus on their qualities and get them to a place of consistently putting in the effort of what they need to achieve and know that their expectations is based on happiness that is going to give them fulfillment in that goal and as long as in meeting those steps they get some way that's good enough from that point there is always another day as long as you're living so my goal for one year will be for my business or be for my podcast god willing or be for public speaking or be for so many things i need to take it one day at a time because i don't have the luxury to expect what i'm expecting without the information for later so i need to be reasonable in my expectations of today too much concentration on tomorrow that's called escapism tomorrow will tomorrow the you everybody could die my mother had covid a couple of months ago um what last year um things changed so then you work with it in the moment adjust your expectations based on where you are at for yourself i'm in my relationship i don't like who i am right now to how with what anybody else says what do i want when i look back at myself i don't want to be sitting around like that okay Excellent. It's interesting. I ask people that question and some people can give me an answer because some people look in the distance. They they have a journey in mind. And I try to get people to recognize, you know, you have a journey but it never goes exactly according to plan. There's always a bump in the road. There's you always something. Know. There's always something that's going to throw you off. Yeah. Yeah. So some people don't like to plan because of what you said. I can't plan because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. No, you next plan week. for it. You, you, you. The the thing is that if you um a person with no plan is is setting himself up or expect expecting failure. So you have a plan. It's not that I didn't have a plan for myself. It just that it didn't work out. Like I said, um, I I planned for accountancy. We moved. I planned for HR. didn't work out that way i started my consultancy because i had enough experience and the ability to gain and work off that because the i didn't let that mode stop me i found my own experience i'm one of the few people who built it on freelancing and systems and data ahead of its time my my issue was that i expected things to work out where i would work 6 years in a comfortable company and then build my consultancy much like everybody else and that's where my expectations change so i have my business i want to go the reason i don't put exact expectation of more than 3 years on that is because i don't know how my other ventures or goals as a dynamic individual will come in and those may shift things those may change the sequence or the the 
the stacking or the multi-prong strategy that I would put in place. And that will change month on month as I have the discipline and resilience to move forward. Excellent, fantastic. I end the mantra, the word prize with the I in the middle. Okay. For me, purpose, resilience, zeal, and expectation are all just good guides to being a good man. And for me, the final piece is I. To me, the I represents you as a person. When mm -hmm. we take the shackles, all the titles, and I guess I can speak from, you know, as an American here, that we as men, and I'm a black man, so I have a different experience from others. We yeah. are fathers, husbands, employees, best friends, all these things. But my question is when I take all of these titles, all of these shackles that are thrust upon us as men in this world, when all of that is put aside at your core, who are you? I'm a holistic human being. A lot of you can. Okay, holistic human being meaning that the way I conduct my life in one side, whether that's business, whether that's as a brother, as an uncle to my nephew, it's holistic. It means that my purpose, I'm the same person no matter what hat I wear. So I will take those same values. I will take that same zeal. I'll take that same, um, you know, res uh, resilience. No matter which role you put me in, it's me. So at the end of the day, I'm not going to have an identity crisis. And it's not going to impact my purpose because no matter circumstances changing, my expectation is always going to be that the one person that's a constant is me in terms of my purpose on life. And that is that it's the same holistic values that I bring, the same uh, sense of conviction in everything that I do. And the problem is that too many people have so many goals, but they, they haven't crafted one identity. Their values are asymmetric. They're in this relationship, they're one person. Other relationship, they, and that's why they have a problem because they don't know who they are. So I say holistic because it's everything. Wonderful. That's wonderful. That's good. That's the first time that I've yeah. heard that answer. Because I think we try to decide I'm this kind of person, but what you've really described is that I am who I am and I'm, I'm this person no matter what I do. I'd call myself a coconut. I was, I was a white man in South Africa with um, you know, white, uh, white sort of a school upbringing with a, with a skin color on the outside. Now I'm here. I've grown more of that Mandarin or orange sort of a personality, but none of that matters if my holistic values, if, I'm, if I have a double standard, and that is a problem with many people and men, is that they don't know who they are. And we, we want gurus to tell us who we are, we want parents and family members to affirm, we want our expectations to be met, but we don't know what we're expecting of ourselves. Brother, you need to know who you are. And you need to know holistically as you're a child when you're birthed into this country that you are free, you are perfect the way you are. That's why anybody listening, hollering at you, holler at you, read no more Mr. Nice Guy. That will explain exactly what I'm talking about. You are who you are and you're perfect and whole as you are. And that's who I am, that's who you are, that's who everybody is. So when I speak to people, they love that aspect because they, I see all of it. And that's what we're scared of. And I don't want to see all of me. I'm scared that if I show this part of me, people are going to judge you one way or another. Rather have your purpose in line with your holistic values. Doesn't matter if your purpose changes tomorrow. You don't want to get married anymore because, you know, things didn't work out a certain way. You weren't with the person who was in line with your values. And still, as long as you are who you are, you're whole. And if that person is not happy on the inside, then change it. Have the discipline and all those things we discussed to change. That's it. Not complicated sciences, not, you know, hocus pocus stuff, you know, not connecting with your inner chakra and all that stuff. You can do all that stuff. Great. Uh, spiritual to in junk to in uno, but yeah, keep it simple. Thank you. I love that. I end with a few questions here, kind of quick ones, and you can answer how you see fit. Um, what are you afraid of 
that you cannot control? Um, that's a good question. Every day is a different fear, but is recognizing that I fear my own fear. If that makes sense, because I fear my fear too much. Once I give my fear moving into it, I understand that that fear was never my fear. So fear changes, it's like the weather. But we fear fear, actually. We fear that we are never gonna overcome our fear. That's the real fear. That's a good one. <laughs> okay. and, the, and the other side of that question is, what are you afraid of that you can control? I'm afraid that I can control myself and that I, that I will, I will be my biggest critic if I let myself down. Because my conscience will always be to say, you, you could have, why didn't you? Why did you give up on yourself? And ultimately that is why the purpose needs to be strong enough. The resilience needs to be strong enough for that. As the only way you're gonna realize your holistic self. Excellent. Okay, next question. My last question for you is this. As men in this world, we have different struggles, different battles that we deal with. And sometimes life can feel heavy on our shoulders. Yeah. So my question to you, and this is just as personal as you allow it to be, yes. Yes. how do you, dealing with life, yeah. self-soothe? What is an exercise? What is something you do when you feel like life might be you know, breaking you down? How do you take time out to control and soothe yourself through what you're going through? I think what I did was I did a couple different, um, this was probably a question that we could have gone into more detail with, but obviously I've done mindset work like the Sedona method to get rid of feelings, but it comes down to the seven, um, it's, it comes down to understanding that look, life is meant to be difficult because life is meant to force you to become what you're supposed to. And the thing is that you have been granted gifts of life, okay? Two hands, two eyes, two feet, okay? What is it that you have that the other person below you doesn't? And why are you using your excuses to play victim, okay? Because when we play victim, what do we do? Oh, this person said this to me. Basically, I'm using that as an excuse to give myself a false delusion of escapism. Instead, what my fear is, is that that person's crippling me. My fear is not that um, I have, if I were to deal with it, that I could go and accomplish everything. And that fear that I have control over how I respond scares everybody. If that makes sense. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay. This has been quite an enlightening conversation, sir. Moeed, I appreciate it. I hope it. so, ladies and gentlemen. I Thank hope you. that, uh, you know, there was a saying my friend uh, used to say, and he was a seven day Adventist, black fellow in South Africa, he used to say, behind every love, there is madness, and behind every madness, there is love. It's important to understand that once you have sought to understand somebody else, then also seek to understand yourself and just be, you know, um, embrace life full on, take your responsibilities up and be holistic is what I would say. Be holistic. Stop looking at the split personality issue that North American literature seems to emphasize, yet African literature talks about whole holistic ethics get down to your holistic ethics, set down the principles as a man in your house with your wife, get on, get on to the court, so to speak, and say, own what you've done wrong and say, hey, I didn't do this. I, I, I need a help from somebody who's done it better. Brother, sister, uncle, aunt, help me out with this. People who won't shame you for it. And look at your guilt and say, guilt, you are there to remind me that I didn't do this, it's not to cripple me. I'll end there. I think I've said enough. Oh no, you said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could talk to you more, but I appreciate that.
Yeah. And with that, your words, you're so eloquent and I love your message. Where can our listeners find you? Social media, website, where can somebody see your words, maybe learn from you a bit? Where can we find you? Ladies and gentlemen, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. Um, I've shared the links with you as well. They can find me, um, you know, just Google my name, even if they find it up there. Um, I'm the only Moeed armored with that spelling in the whole of Vancouver, funny enough. So if you do it, you'll find me on Facebook. The only thing I wish I had more opportunities that I want to pursue for speaking engagements to help individuals like this. Um, and within my own business as well for to help individuals find their purpose within um, organizations that they're working in for um, organizations to be able to lead with purpose, as we say. Um, and um, you know, also to bring people onto my podcast as well. Um, so there's a plethora of those things that I would like to do. I would like to work maybe, uh, you know, in coaching sessions and helping more individuals as well and, and doing a lot of that stuff, not only on the business side, but like I said, as a dynamic individual on the holistic, uh, you know, three in and junk to in uno, those three aspects of it, how that works. So I'm, I'm here to anybody who wants to learn how to do that what the simple steps are that I have been doing and the journey I'm still on. My journey is not done until my ticker uh, stops ticking. And um, please, if you have any opportunities or, or, or you see a potential, I would love to be the listener um, and uh, you know learn how I can help you help others. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And here's how I end these episodes. I, you gave me some information with your bio. And I look for quotes that I've tried to see if they fit for people. Here's what I found, and you let me know what you think. And the quote is this, a smart man makes a mistake, learns from it, and never makes that mistake again. But a wise man finds a smart man and learns from him how to avoid the mistake altogether. My goodness. Okay, that, that's, that's very much on point. But I would say even the smart man makes a mistake but he just needs to recognize that he's not such a smart man because otherwise he would have all the answers. And we never so, have the answers. <laughs> so that's why you go to the wise man who actually, <laughs> who, actually, who actually looked at those things. And yes, I am, I am the person who used to do that. So yes, that is, that is on point. That's a good trip down memory lane in terms of analyzing and learning from the mistakes of others. You sound me pretty nicely. Thank you so much, Javi. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to this podcast, Man of the Prize, where your inner monologue is revealed. See you next week, and you have a great day.